So I want to talk right now about a song that features some of the greatest production work ever put down on record in the 1970s, and it's some that gets under a lot of people's radar. And the song is Kill the King by the band Rainbow, and the producer is Martin Birch. So Martin Birch is well known as being a brilliant and highly influential hard rock and heavy metal producer working with bands like Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden. He was also a instrumental in forming the early sound for Deep Purple. And when Blackmore was doing Rainbow, he was in the Dio era, he was really interested in getting Martin Birch involved in the project. So Martin Birch's uh, connection to Rainbow goes back to the very beginning. And this is an important fact because it's his knowledge of the band and his ability to understand every little nuance about the way that the band works that makes the production on this track so remarkable. So let's start off by giving a little bit of background on Birch and specifically his relationship to Rainbow. On the first album, he was a co-producer. He was the engineer and he mixed the album. On Rainbow Rising, he was the producer, engineer, and he did the mixing. On the live album, on stage, he was the producer, the engineer, and he did the mixing. Now, I mention all of that because on Long Live Rock and Roll, the album that Kill the King is on, he is not only the producer, he is the recording engineer, and he did the mixing for the song. So in the case of Kill the King, what you have is a veteran, almost producer in the hard rock genre, working with a star musician, Richie Blackmore, and a band, Rainbow, with which he is deeply familiar both in a studio and live setting. The song itself, Kill the King, had been played by the band for many years before they got around to recording it on Long Live Rock and Roll. It was their uh, opening song, their set opener for many years. So all of this feeds into the background of how the track was going to be recorded. One final thing to point out about the track is that it's a slightly uncharacteristic track for Rainbow in that it's extremely aggressive. It, it has a message. It has like a political message. And it's not a specific political message uh, directed against any individual political idea. It's just the general idea of tearing down authority. And most of Rainbow's music prior to that had been based around celebrating rock and roll and celebrating myth and telling stories and steeped in fantasy and mysticism. This is a call to action. Between Birch's familiarity with the track and the character of the track itself being this rebellious call to action, that sets up a specific type of production. You could say it's an anthem, so you have to produce the song according to the standards that you would put into a march or a song that's there to, to get under people's skin and motivate them. Instead, what Birch does is he tries to replicate the feeling of being at a live performance, but not the same way that you would get, as we discussed with Whole Lot of Love, Jimmy Page putting you in the room with a band, and not like what was accomplished on Kiss Alive 2, where you felt like you were in the middle of this massive, you know, excited audience with the stage show being implied. Instead, what Birch is doing in this single track is putting you like in the sweetest spot of the auditorium. He's putting you in that one seat or that one spot of the audience where you can perfectly hear the keyboard, the bass, the drums, the guitar, the vocals. And it's a dream come true for a true fan because what everyone wants in the back of their mind when they're listening to their favorite band is to experience the feeling of hearing the song that clearly and that well and that intimately, but being there on the spot with the band in a live setting. So this is what Birch has accomplished in this song. Moreover than understanding the message of the song, or the arrangement of the song, or the individual virtuosic performers, he's understood how to put you in that sweet spot. And here's the problem, or the, here is the 
interesting part about it, which is you can't learn to do this. You can't put it in a book. I can't sit here and break down to you how he did it dial by dial on the console or what methods he used to get that particular production method. For one thing, the production methods that were used in 1978 are pretty much obsolete at this point. And Bert was the recording engineer on this song, so he was patching things together that probably were only done for that track on the spot spontaneously through him. Track therefore reflects almost more his vision of the song than Richie Blackmore's. And that's one thing you can feel when you listen to it, which is of all the people that worked with Richie over the years, and particularly on this track, there are others, but on this track most, you can see that he found a way to blend Blackmore into the band better than was done on Deep Purple, better than was done on, on post Dio Rainbow on the pop era of Rainbow. He found a way to capture that animalistic but yet mystical drive of Blackmore's guitar within the context of the band. Now of course you've got an incredibly good band going here with Bob Daisley on bass and Cozy Powell on drums and of course Dio on vocals. But it's Martin Birch's production that lets this track do what it does and there are very few tracks out there that do what this track does. In fact there are very few Martin Birch tracks that accomplished that what this one does. And I put that down to the fact that both he and the band had experienced this song in a live setting for so many times over that they kind of had a feeling for how it worked. And if you listen to the mix closely, what you can see he's doing is he's not finding a balance. He's not just mixing the instruments all equally. At some points, the bass will be louder. At some points, the drums will be bigger. At some points, the vocals will be bigger. And at some points, the guitar will be emphasized. All of this is to put you in that feeling of being in a live setting where the sound is reverberating around. And he is an amazing producer, as everybody knows, for recapturing a live atmosphere, but on this particular track, he has just gone above and beyond even his own abilities, and he really hit this one out of the park. So I think it's worth going back and listening to it again. If you haven't heard it for a while, and if you're a big Rainbow fan, you listen to it all the time, go back and listen to it and contemplate what it took to put this track together and slap it on Rainbow's final album as the band was dissolving, as they were literally falling apart. He found this unity and harmony and vision of what the Dio era Rainbow really was, which was this incredible hard rock power metal prototype that was at its best in a live setting with this intense excitement, spontaneity. Somehow Birch put this down on record and really, it, if, if more hard rock and heavy metal producers would look at this single track when they go back to mix bands even today, I think that we'd all benefit from it because here he's touched upon something. It doesn't have to be every heavy song is mixed to mimic the feeling of being in a live performance. But if you want to do one that captures the sound of a band in a live setting, Birch has put down the perfect example of how to get it done. Unfortunately, I don't think you can deconstruct much of how he did it because so much of it would have been based in his own instinct and his own experience. And for this reason, I think that the track's important not just to show what Birch could do as a producer, but to show why producers with instincts and experience and judgment and taste and aesthetic sense of their own are just as important as musicians. And so that's what I think. If you have a thought on this or any other issue related to classic or contemporary music, please comment in the section below and remember to like and subscribe. Thanks a lot.